Hello, and welcome to more news and politics. This is for Sunday, October, what is today, the 15th. So yeah, let's start off with the lever. The fog of war in Israel and Palestine. As the long-running quagmire erupts into more bloodshed and destruction, we need to stop dehumanizing the conflict and acknowledge both sides' pain and suffering. On this week's episode of Lever Time, David Sirota is joined by Matt Duss and Daniel Besner, former foreign policy advisors to Senator Bernie Sanders, to discuss the deadly conflict unfolding in Israel Palestine. Below, we are publishing Sirota's introduction to that podcast in full. Okay, let me start with an admission. I don't personally enjoy talking about the Israel-Palestinian issue, and I certainly cannot stand the culture of hot takes that surrounds the entire conflict. I don't like it because it's painful for me and my family as Jews there. I said it. Yes, me and my family are Jewish. For those of you who have followed my work over the last 25 years, you'll notice I almost never write or talk publicly about my religion or Israel. That's because my Judaism is my personal internal creed and not some part of public brand or persona but in light of all the bloodshed in Israel and Palestine over the last few days I'm going to break that tradition if you sense that I have a lot of angst over all this you're right in a world where we are we're not allowed to admit our vulnerabilities. I'm being vulnerable with you by admitting that yes, this issue is deeply difficult and stressful for and painful for me. So I'm asking you to actually hear what I'm saying. You don't have to agree with all of it, but I'm asking you to really listen and it accept this as someone genuinely struggling with how to process all of this. My family has experienced its share of anti-Semitism, including our ancestors who fled the horrors of Eastern Europe in the early 20th century. My family has experienced it in the here and now too. As a radio host and journalist I get periodic anti-semitic hate mail and threats. When I was on radio here in Denver every day of those five years on the air I walked by a photo of the previous host Alan Berg who was literally gunned down by Nazis in our city. In light of that, the images of Hamas terrorism deliberately targeted at innocent Jewish civilians evoked for me all the horrible history of my ancestors being terrorized across generations, targeted because of their identity, culture, heritage, and religion. 
So the very first thing I want to say is that Hamas's terrorism is completely unacceptable. There should be no but or justifying qualification on that statement. It's unacceptable. Period. Full stop. Though much of my childhood and early adulthood, Israel was supposed to be a stronghold against the violence and for a better future. It was seen as a beacon of democracy and specifically left labor social democracy in a region of autocrats and dictators. I think people forget that Israel had labor governments for a very long time. It also stood as the only haven on earth from the anti-Semitism that has raged across the planet for a thousand years. Unfortunately, since that time, Israel has radically changed in ways that have broken my heart and the hearts of so many Jews there and across the world. The Israel of today is governed by a far-right regime that is decided upon militarism and occupation rather than peace and some kind of two-state solution. And that far-right vision has all too often been normalized by the American media and political establishment. The long history of persecution against the Jewish people plus the hostile nature of the surrounding Middle East has been a long time rationale for Israel being a heavily armed and fortified country that zealously defends its inner internal security and external borders with a powerful military. But this Israeli regime has used that military power in inhumane and indefensible ways that dishonor the Jewish based principles it purports to stand for. We're now watching the U.S. armed Israeli army go way beyond defending Israeli citizens and territory and to now mass bombing two million people in Gaza, half of whom are children. This country formed in direct response to the violence of the Holocaust is now committing war crimes. That's totally unacceptable, and nobody should be silent as that happens. The murder of Palestinian civilians is just as unacceptable as the murder of Jewish civilians, and yet somehow that basic statement of universal values is now considered outrageous or taboo in a political discourse that has been deliberately manipulated and polarized into yet another you're with us or against us binary. I reject that binary because it is fundamentally manipulative. Partisans on both sides want us all polarized rather than unified in defense of all human lives and the right of both Israelis and Palestinians to live in peace and security. At this dark moment, I have a few requests of you. I want you to listen to all of them. Don't stop listening just because you feel uncomfortable. And let me be clear, the following points are not in order of importance. First request. Acknowledge that anti-Semitism is real in parts of both the right and left and try to combat it where you can. Right-wing anti-Semitism is, is obvious. It's white supremacy and Nazism. Anti-Semitism on the left 
is different. It can be cloaked in the language of social justice. But try to understand that when left-affiliated groups seem to celebrate this week's Hamas attacks or imply that all Jews support the actions of the State of Israel that is painful and destructive. I think the modern iteration of this form of anti-Semitism comes from the old anti-Semitic idea that Jews are a powerful world-controlling cabal and thus the hatred and murder of Jews is supposedly more morally justifiable in a social justice prank. Especially in the context of the Jewish government, Israeli government's immoral occupation. But here's the thing. There's nothing righteous or social justice-ish about hating Jews and supporting those who murder them. That's anti-Semitism. Second request. Please acknowledge that the Israeli government is run by right-wing extremists whose occupation is inhumane. The Netanyahu government's actions in Gaza right now might not be called terrorism by the media and other world leaders, but they are obviously inhumane and likely war crimes. Those who mindlessly cheer on Netanyahu are sowing the kind of xenophobia and Islamophobia that should have no place in this world. And sorry if you're Jewish and listening to this and ready to accuse me of somehow being disloyal or a self-hating Jew by saying these obvious truths. That Jedi mind trick doesn't work on me. Take that nonsense somewhere else. Third request. If you are cheering on Hamas's murder of Jews or cheering on the Israeli government's murder of Palestinians, then please go to levernews.com right now and unsubscribe from the lever. I don't want you as a subscriber. I want a readership and listenership that values humanity and human life. Fourth request. Before you tweet, post on Facebook, or do anything impulsively in this debate, take a moment and ask yourself whether you are insensitively using the massacre of innocent people on both sides just to channel your priors and play politics. Because if that's what you are doing, that's not helpful. It's part of why we are in this crisis. We have dehumanized this conflict and so many other conflicts into just another tribal political battle where we pretend the issues are so simple. But I'm sorry, they are not. That gets to my final request. Stop pretending this is easy, simple, or binary. One side says this is only about terrorism and security. The other side says this is only about occupation and oppression. But the Israel-Palestine conflict involves all of these things and more. Occupation, oppression, militarism, identity, culture, religion, political ideology, security, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and more. In a society that always wants things reduced to simplicity, this is incredibly complex. If you're ever going to forge a real solution here. It is going to require all of us to grow up, appreciate that complexity, and then behave not just like adults, but like actual human beings. But yeah. I 
I know that's asking a lot. Neither Hamas nor the Israeli government leaders are acting with any humanity at all, but we all have to start thinking like human beings and take time to really try to understand what's going on and feel the pain, horror, and anguish on both sides of this disaster. That's not the both sides trope we've all gotten used to in American politics. It's not to attempt to, uh, it's not an attempt at false equivalency. There are very real villains in this conflict and there is no justification for the atrocities we've seen. What we need is to, internal, to internalize is that all victims, is that there are victims on all sides of this crisis. The people being killed and injured are all human beings. They are referred to in the media as Israelis and Palestinians, but they are all people like you and me. In this dark hour, we need to recommit ourselves to tuning out all the propaganda trying to further dehumanize this conflict. We need to really try to unpack the roots of what's going on. So let's do that. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's already so much stupid shit Floating around bullshit, you know, that propagandizes one side or the other. And it's, it should not be, but no, we, we, fuck, you know, common human moral sense, you better suck down this propaganda and accept it. Well, guess what? I don't. If you are human, you won't. If you have a heart, you will refuse the propaganda that pushes for more war. If you, I haven't posted much this week, but one thing I've been saying is it should be, not be a desire for revenge, but a need for peace and a need for aid. Both sides are suffering. But it's like the only choice is to use a hammer because everyone looks like a goddamn nail. Especially to these monstrous leaders in Hamas and lead leaders of the right wing Israeli government. stupid. Anyway, this is from ProPublica. Legislation to support stillbirth prevention heads to House after unanimous Senate approval. So even though the House is still in a stalemate, the Senate's trying to do stuff. 
Following ProPublica's reporting on the nation's stillbirth crisis, a bipartisan group of senators reintroduced a bill to fund prevention. After the Senate passed the legislation unanimously in September, the House is expected to take it up next, whenever they get their speakership issues resolved. <sighs> Congress is one step closer to prioritizing stillbirth prevention at the federal level. The U.S. Senate unanimously passed the Maternal and Child Health Stillbirth Prevention Act, with, which ensures that federal maternal and child health dollars can be used for stillbirth prevention efforts. Every year in the U.S., more than 20,000 pregnancies end in the death of an unexpected child at 20 weeks of pregnancy or more. Research shows as many as one in four stillbirths may be preventable. 25%. The passage in the Senate marks a milestone for the bill which was first introduced last year but never came up for a vote in either the House or Senate. This time the bill was introduced in July and passed by the Senate on September 30th. ProPublica's ongoing reporting on stillbirths over the last two years has revealed systemic failures that have contributed to the country's stillbirth crisis from federal agencies not prioritizing research, awareness, and data collection to the racial disparities that have led to higher stillbirth risks in black communities. In March, the National Institutes of Health released a report called The Country's Stillbirth Rate Unacceptable High and issued a list of recommendations to reduce it, many of which were aimed at the National Institute of Health and Center of Disease Control and Prevention. Senator Jeff Merkley, Democrat of Oregon, reintroduced the bill with Senator Bill Cassidy, Republican of Louisiana. The next day, U.S. Representatives Ashley Henson, Republican of Iowa, and Alma Adams, Democrat of North Carolina, introduced the measure in the House. ProPublica's investigative reporting has helped call public attention to this major public health concern and with the tremendous advances we've made in modern medicine, we have the capability to do much more. He urged Merkley, the House, to quickly pass the bill, citing the devastating impact stillbirth has on parents and families. He emphasized that some stillbirths can be prevented. Senator Chuck Grassley, Republican of Iowa, an original co-sponsor, said he was grateful that the Senate came together to unanimously pass the legislation and echoed the hope that it continues to move swiftly through Congress. Effective problem solving starts with having a thorough understanding of root causes, contri contributors, and vulnerabilities. Our bill should get rid of limits on federal resources so that the medical community can further pursue evidence-based efforts to support expected 
moms and save babies' lives. The bill united lawmakers from both sides of the aisle and has the power to help save lives and ensure more mothers have the chance to raise their babies, says Senator Tammy Duckworth, the Democrat of Illinois, who added she is eager for Congress to send it to President Biden's desk for his signature. So, yeah. Hopefully, they don't let some of the stupidity from the states interfere. I mean, the whole plan is to prevent stillbirths, but some of the state laws are so dracon draconian that they won't even allow medical procedures to remove stillborn babies because they see it as just another abortion. That's what I'm worried about. We want to prevent them in the first place, but there should be a right to remove them if they are stillborn instead of trying to carry a now stillborn fetus to term. Something that will never fucking happen. Goddamn fucking Republicans. I hate their asses sometimes. Such stupidity. Anyway. Let's move on. Uh, next article. Yeah. Six-year-old boy killed in an anti-Muslim attack, according to police in the U.S. Man charged with the murder and hate crimes after allegedly stabbing two people because they were Muslim. Joseph... Zuba, 71, is accused of killing a six-year-old boy and injuring a woman, 32, in Plainfield, Illinois. God damn it. God. Seriously? They had nothing to do with it. But you're just a fuckhead. God damn people. Why? Why? The victims were targeted because of the current conflict between Hamas and Israel. The Will County Sheriff's Office said. Mr. Zuba was charged with first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, hate crimes, and aggravated battery. In a statement, the Will County Sheriff's Office said that on Saturday morning, it received an emergency call from the woman who said she was being attacked by her landlord. The woman said she ran into the bathroom and continued to fight off her attacker. When officers arrived at the scene, they discovered the woman and the boy with multiple stab wounds to their chest, torso, and upper extremities. Both victims who have not been publicly named, were taken to the hospital, but the boy later died. It was later established that the child was stabbed 26 times. The knife used in this attack is a 12-inch serrated military-style knife that has a 7-inch blade. The woman who was seriously injured is expected to survive the attack. Zubo was found sitting upright 
outside on the ground near the driveway of the residence. He was taken to the hospital for treatment before being questioned by detectives. Detectives were able to determine that both victims in this brutal attack were targeted by the suspect due to them being Muslim and ongoing Middle Eastern conflict involving Hamas and the Israelis. More than 1,400 people were killed in Israel last weekend when the Hamas fighters crossed the border to attack civilians and soldiers. In Gaza, more than 2,450 people have been killed by Israel's bombing, with an estimated thousand missing under the rubble. Send him. He should not get out. Fuckers like that. Uh uh. Lock. He should die in prison. You do not take another life. Just because you fucking feel like it. People like that. Lack of water worsens misery in besieged Gaza as Israel airstrikes continue. Yeah. Israel bounds the Gaza Strip with airstrikes. Leila Abu Samhadina. 65 is anxious about water. The besieged Gaza Strips, 2.3 million people don't have access to clean running water after Israel cut off the water and electricity to the enclave as it intensifies its air attacks in response to a bloody Hamas attack last week. And I know what some people may be thinking. Oh, but isn't Gaza on the coast? Yes. Number one, the water is salty. It needs to go through multiple processes. Number two, even if that were a possibility, Israel makes sure that that is not allowed to happen because they keep ships around that side just to deter Gazans from coming into the water, you know, using the water as an escape path or anything. Yeah, it's ridiculous. This is from The Hill. Jake Tapper cuts off Nikki Haley for blaming Biden for a house not having a speaker. As he fucking should. I'm Congratulations, Tapper, on doing your goddamn job. Pause. Close. Yeah, CNN's Jake Tapper shut down GOP presidential candidate Nikki Haley for blaming Biden for the House being unable to elect a new Republican speaker after Representative Kevin McCarthy's ouster. Tapper asked Haley on State of the Union if Austin, Representative Austin Scott's remarks on the House speakership election were accurate when he said that the speakerless House makes the Republicans look like a bunch of idiots. Haley began her response by criticizing the Biden administration before Tapper jumped in to interrupt saying that the turmoil in Congress 
was not at the hands of the president. Yeah. I mean, this is clear as a goddamn bell. It was the first thing she tries to do. Tries to make it a talking point to attack the other party. <laughs> God. I'm just so tired of the binary bullshit in this world. Anyway, something a little different. This weekend we had a solar eclipse. This is from, this is the view from Utah. They gave us three wonderful images to look at. So let's take a nice look at them here. I love how vividly red the halo of the sun is behind that, uh, behind the moon. It's, it's something I have never had a, well, I think there was one opportunity I had to see it, but I don't think I really got around to actually seeing it. It's something I'd love to do. But yeah, just something to kind of give us a breather from all this bullshit in the news. This is from the Times of Israel. A boss says Hamas does not represent Palestinians. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas says the policies and actions of Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people. Speaking to Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, Abbas says the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, is the only legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. But Israel created a separate organization, Hamas, because they didn't want to have to work with the PLO. Abbas also calls for the release of prisoners and detainees by both sides and re reiterates his claim that the displacement of Gazans would constitute a second Nakba. Maduro says he is dispatching humanitarian aid to Gaza. Good. So, yeah. This is from Reuters. Britain has urged Pal uh, Israel. Britain has urged Israel to show restraint says cleverly. It might be cleverly, but I'm thinking it's cleverly. Um, Britain remains supportive of Israel's right to defend itself, but has urged it to show restraint in any military action against Palestinian militant group, 
Hamas in order to minimize harm to civilians, Foreign Minister James Cleverly said. Speaking to the media on Sunday, Cleverly said he had raised the need to minimize civilian casualties in conversations with the Israeli government. Restraint. Discipline. These are the hallmarks of the Israeli Defense Force that I want to see. I'm glad somebody in government that's an ally is telling them, use restraint. You do not need to go in and massacre people. Because from what I'm seeing so far, most of them are just like, no, Israel has the right to commit a genocide. That's how some of these people are acting. Of course, they don't say those exact words because they know how that's construed. But, yeah, they get mad when you suggest that both sides are wrong and there are there is pain on both sides because too often we're seeing people in positions of power say so you don't think Israel has the right to defend it that is not what they said buckhead anyway this is from Reuters a mosque critique removed from Palestinians' Abbas comments on Israel attack. The Palestinian Authority's official news agency published comments on Sunday by President Mahmoud Abbas that criticized Hamas over its actions but later removed reference to the military group without providing an explanation. The comments published by Wafa on its website came during a phone call between Abbas and Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. So, you know, in a previous article we was looking at, it showed he denounced Hamas, but apparently that reference was removed. And Israel resumes water supply to southern Gaza after U.S. pressure. So we also read an article that states they were turning off water to Palestinians. Yeah, lack of water. Well, Israel resumes water supply. And then we have Yeah, Abbas denouncing Hamas, but then uh, they say that was removed. So I, we're, this whole situation is causing so many changes so quickly. Israel resumed on Sunday the water supply to the southern Gaza Strip after strong pressure from the Biden administration. Israel's decision to completely stop the water supply to Gaza exacerbated the already dire humanitarian situation in Gaza, 
with aid groups warning water supplies were quickly running out. Israel announced on the second day of the war it was stopping all of the water supplied to Gaza. Israel Minister of Energy Israel Katz had said that no water spigot will be opened until the hostages Hamas is holding were freed. Israeli officials say the Biden administration pressed the Israeli government in the last 48 hours to resume water supply, especially to the southern part of the Gaza Strip. Israel has told more than one million Palestinians to evacuate the northern part of the Strip to the south to avoid being harmed by Israel's expected ground offensive. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians have since moved to the south, putting more pressure on limited supplies and shelters. The Biden administration told Israel that it couldn't tell Palestinians to evacuate to the southern Gaza Strip without allowing them to have water. Well, good. He should have been calling for peace and aid from the start instead of acting like he's going solely to back Israel. Like I said, there is suffering and pain on both sides, but it's like only Israel's getting <laughs> the help it needs. All right, pause. A CGTN correspondent breaks down in tears while reporting in Gaza. This is a uh, CGTN is China something television network. I'm not sure what the full name is, but yeah, it, it's a Chinese news reporting network. But let's go live to Noor Harazin for us in Gaza. Noor, thank you for joining us this hour. Now the six. Our window Israel set for Gazans to move south has just ended. What does the situation on the ground look like now? You can see she's already in pain. It, it, it's... And I don't blame her. I mean... It has got to be distressing to report from inside Gaza. <laughs> Well, I am standing in Ashhad Al-Aqsa Hospital, which is located in Deir al-Balah in southern Gaza. And this is where basically the Israeli military asked Gazans to evacuate. And what we are witnessing right now is whole families, children, women arriving to the hospitals. The Israeli warplanes uh, attacked and striked a home that belonged to Abu Jbara family located in Deir al-Balah in southern uh, Gaza, we saw whole families. I myself saw children, at least 10 children, under the age of five with their heads cut off, uh, their bodies. Uh, if you can see around me, we can still see the ambulances arriving to the um, Shuhada Al-Aqsa Hospital, mostly women, mostly children. I mean, this is indescribable. This is like a massacre. The number that was published from the um, Palestinian Health Ministry is that the death toll here in Gaza is up to 2,215 Palestinians. But me standing right here in the hospital, I can clearly tell you that the number is going up every hour. Yeah. You can tell she's terrified. She's shaken. Just... It's, it's ridiculous. Jeez. Oh, More injuries arrived to the hospital. Here is an ambulance full of children. 
I can see the children where I'm standing. The situation is indescribable. Whole families, children under the rubble, children being killed. I have never witnessed anything like that. I've been covering escalations on Gaza for years now. And what we're witnessing right now is whole massacres. This is just I mean talking about it from a safe location, you know, here in the US. <laughs> it's hard to talk about. You know, I, I get angry, I get fed up with it. There's no call for such things to ever happen. But unfortunately, it's something we see too fucking often. Goodness knows how she's having to deal with it. These ambulances are arriving from Abu Jbara family, one of the families that reside in uh, Dar al Balah city, which is located in southern Gaza, where hundreds of thousands of families from northern Gaza, basically, and from central Gaza city, evacuated to this city because they thought that they will be safe, and this is a shelter for them, because this is what, what, what was published by the Israeli military. For the residents of Gaza and northern Gaza to move to cities in uh, uh, southern Gaza, however, what we were saying from the morning while I I was here, I am here in Shuhada uh, Al-Aqsa Hospital is hundreds of people, hundreds of children. I'm losing the words. More ambulances arrived to the hospital. It's a total chaos here in the hospital. And adding to all of this is that the Gaza Strip is under a siege. No fuel, no medicine, no medical supplies are entering the Gaza Strip. So the hospitals are basically suffering while receiving more injuries and more people killed. Newer, take, take a deep breath. I want you to be safe. If you don't feel safe on the street, feel free to go any minute. I'm not sure how much longer we can have you reporting for us there, but while we... Yeah, you could tell she's already so badly shaken on just the reporting she has done. You know, these things should not happen. Why can't we just treat each other as people and work together peacefully to find resolutions? No. Unfortunately, there are asshats who love to destroy others who see it as their right. And no, it is not your right to decimate and destroy other human beings. We can still have you. Talk to us more about how did it happen? Does this mean that attacks are happening in southern Gaza as we speak? Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm in, in Shahada Al-Aqsa Hospital and most of the people arriving, all of the people arriving, are people that were killed or injured during the Israeli strikes in their homes in Deir al-Balah, which is located in southern Gaza, just where the Israeli military asked the Palestinian citizens to head for their safety. And as you can see behind me and around me, there is actually nowhere safe here 
in Gaza. And we're not talking about militants, we're talking about whole families, children and women, their uh, homes were uh, attacked while these people were inside their homes. And we're not only talking about uh, uh, people who are from Dar al Balah inside their homes, but we're talking about uh, these people were taking in um, people who came from Gaza and from northern Gaza to take shelters in their homes. Look at the children, babies, months old. Incredible. Mostly women Incredible. and children. This baby is dead. They are taking him Jeez. to the fridge, basically, because he's dead. They, 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 they are not bothering even taking him to the hospital because he's not injured. He's dead. This is the situation from my side now. This is how southern Gaza looks. Horrifying and keep in mind this is where Israel's telling Palestinians, yeah, this is the one you want to go to because we may very well be attacking other hospitals, other locations, because that, that where we believe Hamas may be staying, but but it's like they tell Palestinians they say, but if you go to this one, you'll be fine. Horrific scenes where babies are killed. And as you said, these victims are not from northern Gaza. They're killed and injured after they were evacuated to southern part of Gaza. Poor women and all of this all of these people that you're seeing came from an airstrike on just one home Abu Jubara family that they they were taking shelter in their home in southern Gaza while other families also evacuated to their home feeling safe thinking that it will be a shelter for them but as you saw we are reporting their death. And Noor, when did this happen? Did this happen after the deadline set by the Israeli side? Right after the deadline? Sorry? Noor, you know what? I'm gonna let you this go. Happened, uh, this happened just, this, this happened just uh, uh, like half an hour ago. And it does not matter if it's before or after the deadline because basically these people are in southern Gaza. It's the safe place that the Israeli military asked the people of Gaza to evacuate to. Yeah. Israel told Palestinians go to southern Gaza because north Gaza is where we're going to sweep through here. And yet. So even before or after the deadline, they are supposedly in the safe area. And obviously this is a land that are no, where nowhere is safe right now. But before I let you go very quickly, Noor, Egypt and Israel have agreed to let foreign citizens leave the Gaza Strip through the Rafah crossing. Do we know anything about it? Are foreign citizens leaving? Well, uh, yes, the embassies for hundreds of Palestinians here in Gaza who are holding other nationalities asked them to head to the uh, Rafah border this morning. However, while we're speaking now, these people are still outside of Rafah border. They are uh, still waiting the border to open. However, no one managed to leave the Gaza Strip. We're talking about more than 400 people who are holding the Palestinian nationality and also other nationalities, American, uh, other nationalities, but they're stuck in Gaza, even though their embassies asked them to head to the border this morning, but actually they're still stuck in Gaza. Egypt did not open the 
Rafah border for those people who are uh, inside Gaza. While I'm speaking to you now, we can still hear the ambulances coming inside the Ash Shuhada Al Aqsa Hospital in Deir al Balah. Here is a new group of people. Okay. Okay, Noor. These, uh, these injuries are shredded, so, so they put them basically in blankets to, to carry their body parts. Yes, I understand. It's a lot. It's a lot to take in, Noor. This I'm is gonna, the situation from my side. Yes, I'm gonna let you go now, Noor. Please do stay safe. Take shelter. Thank you so much, Noor. Noor Harazin, live for us on the ground there, reporting on the horrific. Horrifying. Jeez. That's what's going on. You know. It's just ridiculous. This. The wife of the doctor. Who lost his son in an Israeli airstrike that also injured their family pleads to see her child. A nurse signals from a distance that they can only show her his right half. Pause. They're comforting the father who is the doctor there. It's. And now we're going to be seeing the mother come in shortly. Yeah, there's the nurse indicating they can only really show the right half. And, you know, he's here holding his wife because she's pleading to see the body of her child. <laughs> It's just ridiculous. Yeah, make sure these are muted. Okay, Jewish New Yorkers getting arrested by the NYPD for protesting against genocide. So we have some New Yorkers of Jewish descendancy protesting and getting arrested by the NYPD. Thank you. 
my grandfather survived Auschwitz, and that is why I fight for a free Palestine. I have always felt deeply connected to his memory and to his love. Um, his story has inspired me always to seek justice. And so last night, as Shabbat came in, I took my Jewish star necklace, which belonged to my Saba, my grandfather, and I clasped it around my neck, and then I... Yeah. I've already made this comparison, I'm, and I've said, it's not the same as the Holocaust, but it's not far off from it. The way they have Palestinians locked in this little strip of land and they you know just dropping bombs on them cutting off important things like electricity and water and yes it's not a direct one to one but it's not far I clasped my arms with over 100 other New Yorkers to block traffic so that the world would hear us say, as Jews, we unequivocally call for an end to the genocide happening at this very moment in Gaza. As we were being taken to jail, those around me were sharing stories of their grandparents, and we were all deeply feeling our ancestors with us last night as we took a stand against genocide because we know what it looks like. While we were at Chuck Schumer's house calling for a ceasefire, he was inside preparing for a trip to Israel to pledge more weapons and more money for ethnic cleansing in Gaza. We are only going to build from here. We are going to escalate to bring an end to U.S. complicity and moral cover for this violence. We will never stop fighting against genocide, and we will not stop fighting until Palestine is free. Yeah, because unfortunately, it's having to come down to citizens who are having to speak out because the government damn sure don't give a fuck it don't seem like. This is the last one here. Richard, MP Richard Boyd Barrett addresses Israel's recent attacks on Palestine during a session of the lower house of the Irish Parliament. The Israeli government have brazenly, publicly, and openly declared their intention to commit a war crime and have commenced that war crime against the people of Gaza, saying that they intend to starve of food, electricity, water, 2.2 million people. They are raining down thousands of the most sophisticated missiles known to humanity onto the most densely populated area in the world, carrying the certainty that almost every missile will incur civilian casualties. And you try to suggest there is some symmetry, some equivalence between the actions of Hamas and what Israel has been doing to the Palestinians for decades. And every single loss of life is terrible. But is the failure of the United States, of the European Union, of the Western powers to hold to account Israel for ongoing decades long ethnic cleansing, war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, the denial of the most basic rights to the Palestinian people? Exactly. It is completely true. And again, I've said this over and over. I am not against Israelis having the right to defend themselves. But when do we go from defending to they should not be committing war crimes? I mean, honestly, tell me where that line is. 
Because to me, it already looks like they have fucking crossed it. That's why, I personally, I think there needs to be an end to this dream of a two party state. We need a coalition force that goes in, breaks down the wall around Gaza and the West Bank, allow free integration, end the occupation BS, allow free interspersed travel, and like I said, we need a coalition force to make sure there is a peaceful coexistence and integration. Because otherwise, I don't see it happening. Because right now, it only feels like the way the U.S. struggled with a separate but equal ideology that never was truly equal. But I'm going to go ahead and end this episode here. As always, educate thyself, think, read, study, learn. Someone tells you something you have trouble believing, ask them to cite their sources. I will be putting the links in the description box below the video. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all in the next one. Until then, later.